this is study number five in a seven part series of Israel and the church and we looked at the early church the title of that message was the early church is Jewish and the second message was the Jewish apostles and the apostles doctrine what was it um, we looked at our third study which was the church and the feasts the feasts of the Lord which the whole church will be involved with at least in the millennium and the Bible tells us that uh, all the nations will be expected to come up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles you can read about it in Zechariah chapter 14 and then our next study was the one new man the one new man church was a combination of Israel and the church of the nations the Gentiles who have come to Christ now be sure that there's only one name under heaven whereby somebody can be saved and it's the name of Jesus uh, but revival is coming to the Jewish people and they will in time recognize Jesus as their Messiah and already many Jews have not stopped being Jews but they recognize Jesus as their Messiah and they've come into the fullness of everything that God has for them well tonight we're going deeper into this subject and I could get myself in lots of trouble uh, but it wouldn't be the first time uh, because I'm speaking about Israel's military defense I am absolutely convinced that one of the main reasons why Trump is hated by a certain group of people in the United States um, is because he has supported Israel and when he decided to do something that eight presidents promised but never did that they would move the embassy from Tel Aviv the US Embassy to Jerusalem uh, they didn't want to do it because it was they thought it might start World War three and uh, President Trump said he would do it like they all said they would do it when they were campaigning now only he tends to try to make things happen that he promised that he would do and he did that an amazing thing he's also done many other things uh, but Israel has a supernatural and will become more supernatural military defense there are angels watching over that country even the warriors who went to war in over the past 75 years fighting for Israel have testimony after testimony of bands of angels coming to protect them their enemy fleeing because they looked above the heads of the Israeli soldiers and saw angels protecting them uh, it's an amazing story and, and you can we have a whole series of uh, movies where people are giving testimony soldiers of these things that happen supernaturally see Israel is God's prophetic time clock remember in Matthew 24 the Lord said to his disciples these are the signs of the end of the age and of my coming and then he talked about earthquakes and famines and trouble in all wars in all places but all of those things have been happening for thousands of years but there is one other sign that he gave and it was Israel he said when you see the fig tree putting forth its tender shoots know that the time is at hand and this generation will not pass away until all of the things that he mentions in the chapter including the return of the Lord will happen so this fig tree sending forth its tender shoots is Israel and in 1948 it became a nation again it was birthed after 47 different prophecies in the Bible in different places that say by an oath I will give you back your land and I will bring your people back to that land and I will restore your fortunes before your very eyes and I will fulfill the promises that were spoken to the patriarchs and the Lord will do it so when we see this happening in our lifetime the wars the earthquakes they've always been here but it's only been since 1948 when my mother was 15 years of age a, a little Jewess living there in Jerusalem at that time bomb came through her bedroom went right through her bed she was a good thing she got up to go to the bathroom 
because it, it just went right through her bed, and she would have been killed, and I wouldn't be here. <laughs> and, but since that time, 1948, May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation again. And now the fulfillment of all that God has for Israel and for the church is unfolding like clockwork according to God's sovereign plan. And in the middle of this plan, God promised them increased land ownership, that Israel will grow in size. I'm going to show you that tonight. And also that the Lord himself would protect and watch over Israel with military might that starts off with extraordinary manpower and weaponry, but ends up with supernatural protection. I am very much aware that it is the United States of America that has been the champion nation to partner with Israel for her national defense. Since 1948, and President Harry Truman, you know, he wasn't voted in as president. He was the vice president. And just before Israel became a nation, just a while before, a couple of years before that, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt died. And Harry Truman, who was a Baptist and had some very good friends who were Jewish, became the president of the United States. And with the help of his Jewish friends, President Truman went to the nations of the world and said, you need to vote yes at the United Nations that Israel can become a nation again. And since that time, even with presidents who have not been the most favorable towards Israel, such as the one from the previous administration, yeah, without mentioning any names, even that president supported Israel more than the other nations of the world with military defense. And now we have a president who has supported Israel more than any other president in history. Of course, his name is Donald, Donald Trump. And even the president, the prime minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, has said that they have never had such support from any nation or from the United States like they have today. Do you know why this is happening? It's happening because of the church in America. Because of the evangelical church in the United States of America that is a strong political entity fighting for the purposes of God to preach the gospel, to help the poor, to defend those who are oppressed, to set captives free, and to stand with Israel. And that is an amazing thing. The church in the United States of America, might, we might criticize and we might say a lot of them are not real Christians. We might give lots of things that where we might point at, at the church. But you ought to be thankful. There's no country besides Israel like the United States of America. And there's no church in the world like the church in this USA. And as the church in the United States goes, so the church will go around the world. And this nation has now taken an even stronger place to support Israel. And it's because of the evangelical church in this nation. So we need to get into the Word. Because I have so much to teach you about this tonight. And I'm going to need a little miracle to get through it. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would bless us tonight, that this word would go far and wide, and that people, their eyes would be open to see the eternal plans of God that are absolutely unstoppable. Lord of hosts, we know it's your zeal that will perform these things concerning Israel. Let it come, and let it be done for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 15, and we're going to find out what happened at the time when Abram, or Abraham, uh, as his name became, made a covenant with God, and God made a covenant with Abraham. 
And it says in verse 18, this is Genesis 15, verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt, say the river of Egypt, to the great river of the Euphrates, say the Euphrates. So we're talking from the Nile to the Euphrates. God says, I'm going to give your descendants this land and the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, sounds like chocolates, um, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Jebusites are always the last. And these, there's, this list is mentioned several times, but Jebu is the city that David conquered 400 years after the children of Israel came into the promised land. He conquered the city of Jebu where the Jebusites were. And then he bought Aruna's threshing floor, Aruna the Jebusites. And that's where the temple is. But it's the last one to be conquered of all these people groups. Well, if you go to a map, most of you have a map in the back of your Bible. And you look at the very first map in the list. And it'll probably be a map of the patriarchs. And that's, there you'll see Ur of the Chaldees where uh, Abraham comes from. And you'll see kind of an overview of the Middle East. And then you'll see some shadings. And you'll see at the top, you'll see Hittites. And Hittites, the land of the, the Hittites in the days of the patriarchs was a huge empire. One of the largest empires ever in the Middle East. And they were very powerful and very strong. But you can see how extensive, if you look on that map, the land of the Hittites was. And the Bible here says to Abraham, God says, I will give you the land from the Nile River, which is into Egypt, all the way halfway through present day Iraq to the Euphrates River. And that means the northern part of Saudi Arabia. It means the whole country of Jordan. It means the whole country of Lebanon. It means the whole country of Syria and the southern portion of Turkey. Before Israel has all of the land that God has promised to Abraham and his descendants, that's how big Israel will become. And it will happen because of the attacks of these nations round about. Just as it happened since 1948. Every time there was a war, Israel took more land. Every time they were attacked, they took more land. And so it will come in the days ahead of us. Don't worry about a nuclear bomb coming from Iran. Not only will the United States not allow it, not only will Israel not allow it, God will not allow it. Because when Jesus returns, he's not coming to a hole in the ground that was blown apart by a nuclear bomb. He's landing on the Mount of Olives and he's going on the Temple Mount and he's blowing that abomination called the Dome of the Rock away and he, by that time there'll be a temple actually there and he will set up his throne and rule and reign so no nuclear bomb is going to land on that site. So here we see the promise right at the beginning. See, the promises of God concerning Israel were established before the world was created. Because God is bringing his throne to this place. It says, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in that city. And he designed that he would have a special group of people who would help him around his throne. A chosen people whose task would be as a banner to the nations. Whose task would be to welcome and to host the nations as they come to celebrate the feasts of the Lord. He chose this people for that task. So that when the nations of the saved come from all over, there will be a people there in that place who are specially trained. Theirs is the temple worship. To them belongs the covenants. To them belongs the promises. To them belongs the receiving of the law. 
To them belongs the divine glory. To them belongs the adoption of sons. To them belongs the human lineage of Jesus. To them belongs the patriarchs. So there's eight things. You want to know where it's found? Yeah. It's found in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. Paul says these things belong to them. And I just quoted them to you. So there is something that's going to happen. And in the process, all the nations will come against Israel. And Israel, from this time forward, I promise you, Israel will not lose a war. And their land will increase as they defend themselves. It will grow to the assigned proportions that were given to Abraham. All the land from the Nile to the Euphrates, all the land of all the ites, including the Hittites, will belong to Israel. Now, it doesn't mean that there won't be Jordanians who are believers and who still live there. There will still be Syrians who will become believers and will live there. But the land, the government of the land, will be Israel. Well, let's move on. I want to take you now into the book of Isaiah, chapter 17. And we're going to read a little bit about Syria. We're going to look at Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt. And then we're going to go into the details of this war according to the scriptures. So first of all, Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1. It says, an oracle concerning Damascus. Damascus is the capital of what country? Syria. Right. And it's, you can almost see it when you come with us to Israel. And we go to the northern edge of the country. And we look out from Bentel. And it's a military, was a military post. There's Mount Hermon. And way off in the distance, you can't quite see it, but there is Damascus. And you're on the road that Paul took to the Damascus. And when we were there one year, there were bombs blowing up in Damascus. And while we couldn't see the city, we saw the plumes of black smoke. Because it was that time when uh, Assad and the Syrians were having intense civil war and we saw the smoke coming off of Damascus well this is what it says and an oracle concerning Damascus see Damascus will no longer be a city but will become a heap of ruins do you know that Damascus is the oldest continuously dwelt city in the world now Jericho is older but there was a time period when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, you know. And then there was a curse that was put on it that whoever rebuilds the city of Jericho uh, with the laying of its foundations, one of his sons would die with the setting up of its gates, another one of his sons will die. And then it happened that so-and-so in the days of Ahab rebuilt the city of Jericho and had two of his sons die, one with the laying of the foundations and one with the setting up of the gates, according to the prophecy of Joshua, the son of Nun. So, <clears throat> because of that, it is the oldest city in the world, but not the continuously lived in city of the world. That's the oldest. Damascus is. And it has never been a heap of ruins. But over this last five years, a good portion of Damascus for the first time has become a heap of ruins because of the civil war but it will be completely destroyed it says see Damascus will no longer be a city but will become a heap of ruins now come with me to Zechariah we're gonna come back to Isaiah but in Zechariah chapter 9 we read a little bit more about Damascus and we also then read about Lebanon and we also read about the Palestinians and what is going to happen with them. So here, starting in verse 1. The word of the Lord 
is against the land of Hadrach and will rest upon Damascus. This land of Hadrach is Syria. And it says, For the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord and upon Hamath. Hamath is another word for Syria, which borders on it. And upon Tyre and Sidon. And those are the cities of what country? The coastal cities of Lebanon. The coastal cities are Tyre and Sidon. So this is now talking about Lebanon. And it says, And upon Tyre and Sidon, though they are very skillful, Tyre has built herself a stronghold. She has heaped up silver like dust and gold like the dirt of the streets. But the Lord will take away her possessions and destroy her power on the sea, and she will be consumed by fire. So here we see that the Lord is going to judge Lebanon and is also going to judge Syria. And we just read that Damascus will be no more. Now we shift our focus to the southern uh, part of the southeastern corner of the Mediterranean Sea, where is the territory of Gaza. And that's where the Palestinians are. In fact, that's where the, there are the five cities of the Philistines, is where Goliath came from Gath. And that, those cities down there, um, Ekron, Ashkelon, Gaza, Gath, those are the cities of the Philistines. There are no Philistines anymore. Palestinians are not Philistines. Uh, but they are living in that place now. So let's find out what it says in verse 5. This is Zechariah chapter 9, verse 5. Ashkelon will see it in fear. Gaza will read in agony and Ekron too for her hope will wither. What are they going to see and wreathe in fear? They're going to see the destruction of, of Damascus in Syria and the destruction of Tyre and Sidon in Lebanon and they're going to be so afraid because the Palestinians look for hope from Hezbollah and Hamas. And the centers of Hezbollah and Hamas are in Syria and Lebanon. And they're looking for those countries to come to their aid. But when Damascus in Syria and Tyre and Sidon and Lebanon are destroyed, then it says that the Palestinians, the people of Gaza, will read in agony, the people of Ekron too, for their hope will wither. I want you to uh, look, for, look down a little bit. It says... Gaza will lose her king and Ashkelon will be deserted. Foreigners will occupy Ashdod. And it says in verse 7, I will take the blood from their mouths, the forbidden food, food from beneath their teeth. Verse, uh, halfway through verse 7, it says, Those who are left will belong to God. So revival actually will come to the Palestinian people, but not after warfare takes place. And this actually will happen in all of the Arab nations, that they will attack Israel and be defeated. And then they will come to the Lord. And those who are survivors will become leaders in Israel. So let's see. Those who are left and will, be, will belong to God and become leaders in Israel, become leaders in Judah. That's that next verse right there. And so now... We're going to move on, and I'm going to show you a little bit more um, with regard to Egypt. I have so much to teach you, so I'm kind of rushing along. Are you still with me? If anyone needs a little nap, just feel free. All right, come with me to Isaiah chapter 19 and verse 15. We're going to find out what's going to happen with Egypt. And this has not yet happened. This is still in time to come. But this is amazing. It says that if you read the whole first part, Egypt will attack Israel like terrorists. And we've already seen that happen. And it's gone back and forth over the last 30 years with Egypt and Israel. Um, but it's going to come to a place. And I don't think it's too far off in the distance where Egypt will really uh, attack 
Israel and be so devastated. So it says in verse 14, the Lord has poured into them a spirit of dizziness. They make Egypt stagger in all that she does as a drunkard staggers around in his vomit. There is nothing Egypt can do, head or tail, palm branch or reed. Verse 16, in that day, the Egyptians will be like women. They will shudder with fear at the uplifted hand that the Lord Almighty raises against them. And the land of Judah, that's Israel, will bring terror to the Egyptians. Everyone to whom Judah is mentioned will be terrified because of what the Lord Almighty is planning against them. So God Almighty is working with Israel and when Egypt attacks, Israel retaliates and really demolishes them so much so that the Egyptians become totally depleted and weak and full of fear. Um, but if you read on in verse 23, after they, let's go to verse 22. It says, the Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and then heal them. Do you know the whole book of Revelation is about that? It's about the Lord striking because of judgments. And then when people humble themselves and call upon the Lord, he heals them and saves them. And that's what it just says right here concerning Egypt. The Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. That's the Egyptians. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Assyria is not Syria. It is actually Iran, uh, excuse me, Iraq. So Egypt to Assyria or Iraq and the Iraqians, the Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Iraq. And the Egyptians and Assyrians, the Iraqians, will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third along with Egypt and Iraq, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, Iraq, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. And there will be a holy highway that goes from Egypt to Israel and to Iraq. So both these nations are going to be terrorist nations. They will attack Israel. They will be demolished. But after they're demolished, many, the survivors, will turn to the Lord, make vows to the Lord, worship the Lord, and he will heal them and then he will call them his people and they will set up the, the altars of the Lord, the worship of the Lord in those countries. And the Lord says they will be like a triad of holy people, uh, these three nations. So um, just because people are in a bad state right now, it's not the end of the story. But it's going to get worse before it gets better. All right, I need to hurry on. Let's go now to the book of Zechariah, shall we? Zechariah, we're going to go into the details now of step by step in chapter 12 of Zechariah. We're going to go through this chapter. I'm going to race through it uh, in our remaining 25 minutes or so and give you a play-by-play -play of the battles that will come against Israel and what God's going to do on their behalf. We are right here at this point in time where this chapter is about to unfold. In fact, it has already started. So here we go. You ready? Fasten your seatbelts. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. The Lord, who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth, and who forms the spirit of man within him declares. So the Lord wants you to know he's about to tell you what's going to happen to Israel. And he identifies himself. I'm the God who made the heavens. I'm the God who made the earth. And I'm the God who made you. And this is what I have to say about Israel. CNN does not have the final word on Israel. The United Nations does not have the final word on Israel. 
The European common market, Russia or China, do not have the final word on Israel. In fact, the United States doesn't have the final word on Israel. God Almighty has the final word on Israel because it's according to His eternal purpose and plan, and it is unstoppable. He has chosen that people. He has chosen that place. He has chosen that city. He has chosen that mountain. He's bringing His throne there. He's preparing this people as messed up as they might be today. He's going to fix them. And they're already on their way. So he says, this is the word. Verse 2. I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. That word reeling is actually an intoxication of hatred. And that's exactly where we see it right now. Since, the, since they have become a nation, the surrounding Arab nations have said, we will drive them into the sea. Starting, first of all, they said they will never become a nation. And, uh, of course... Um, all of the Arab nations and Muslim nations around the world hate Israel. Why do they hate them so bad? They only have a little piece of land. I'll tell you why they hate them, because it's demonic. It's a demonic hatred. It's a demon-inspired hatred against the purposes of God Almighty. <clears throat> so Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. So from this point on, Israel will be an immovable rock. Absolutely unmovable. And it goes on. It says, all who try to move it will injure themselves. Now, isn't that exactly what happens? Every time somebody attacks Israel, they're the ones that end up getting hurt real bad. And then it goes on the news, and, you know, there's over 50 resolutions against the United States because of their retaliation. Because if, if yeah, sorry, Israel, thank you. Because as soon as a bomb is, or missile is sent from Lebanon or Syria or Gaza and it, towards Israel, it almost never reaches a city. You know, and they have the Iron Dome, which actually Obama instituted and put there. And um, they have this computerized thing where, a, you know, a missile comes and there's kind of like a, an invisible covering. As soon as it does, these automatic, it's automatic, a um, um, counter-missile goes up and destroys that missile that's coming in. And uh, then you hear the helicopters. And they go right to the house where this missile was sent and, and blow it to bits. And of course, then it's on the news. There's people crying, you know. And, uh, but that's exactly what happens. Whoever tries to move it will injure themselves. I'm going to skip a little bit. Go down to verse 5. Then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts. That's the leaders of Israel will say in their hearts. The people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. See, in the Second World War, when the Holocaust took place, Half of the Jews in the world were murdered. And more than a million of them were children under the age of 12. Six million Jews were killed in the Second World War because of the Holocaust. When Hitler was asked, what do we do with the Jewish children? He said, do not call them children. Just call them little Jews. So, this happened to the Jewish people and so many of them lost their faith. They had a faith in the God of Abraham. Most of them didn't know Jesus as their Messiah. But they had faith in the God of Abraham. And so many of them lost their faith. 
They became secular because they said, how can God allow this to happen to us? It's half of our population around the world. Six million and over a million of them are children under the age of 12. The revival is coming to Israel. And it's not just same old, same old. It's an upgrade. It's the big, yeah, it is the new covenant many of them will come into. And they will see Jesus as their Messiah. And that will be a great day. But this is where we are right now. Where the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong. Why? Not because never again and because we're such a strong people, but because the Lord Almighty is their God. They're making this proclamation. Verse 6, on that day I will make the leaders of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile. What happens if you put a fire pot in a wood pile? You're going to get spontaneous combustion. The whole thing's going to light on fire, and that's exactly the way it is right now they're like a flaming torch among the sheaves and they will consume right and left all the surrounding peoples but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place I want you to notice that in this sermon tonight I am not giving you a lot of my own opinion I am reading you scripture after scripture after scripture and just telling you what the Bible says alright so here it says that they will consume left, right and left all the surrounding peoples, but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. Now verse 7. The Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first. All right? Now verse 8. On that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem. That is this day. And who's going to shield the people of Jerusalem? Can somebody tell me? The Lord. On that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them will be like David, the warrior king. And the house of David will be like... Somebody tell me what it says. How can it be that the house of David could be like God? Did I make this up? It's right there in your Bible, isn't it? Like the angel of the Lord going before them. On that day, I will set out. Who's going to set out? God's going to set out. This is when it gets supernatural. On that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. So let's just kind of unwrap this. He says, on this day, this day hasn't come yet, but we're fast moving towards it. Supernatural military defense over the land of Israel where the, God will make the feeblest among them like the warrior King David. So who's the feeblest in society? The seniors? The children? The handicapped? I don't know. I would not want to attack a nation where the grandmothers can beat you up. <laughs> the Lord says he's going to make the feeblest among them like the, like the house of David, like the warrior king. So this is amazing. Well, now with computers, you understand it. Here's Grandma. And she's making some baklawi and some falafel. And she's got the olives there. And, uh, you know, the hummus. She's making this great salad. And she's got her computer. All of a sudden, there's an attack coming in on her computer. Oh, those bad guys. She pushes the button. Goes back to making her dinner. <laughs> Way to go, Grandma. Grandma's got a missile. We could change Grandma got ran over by a reindeer to Grandma in Israel's got a missile, right? <laughs> Something like that. Well, I'm, I'm not making this up. It says the feeblest among them will be like the house of David and the house of David will be like God that I, I can't get my head wrapped around that but like the angel of the Lord going before them the death angel in Egypt and then the Lord says not only am I going to empower them 
like with supernatural ability. He says, on that day, I personally, God Almighty, will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. And this is when revival comes. See the next verse, verse 10, my favorite verse. It says, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and of supplication. And they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day the weeping in Jerusalem will be great like the weeping of Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn each family or clan by itself with their wives by themselves. The clan of the house of David and their wives. The clan of the house of Nathan and their wives. The clan of the house of Levi and their wives. The clan of the house of Shimei and their wives. And all the rest of the families and clans and their wives. So let me explain this to you. When bombs are flying, and God lifts the military defense of Israel to a whole new level that the world has never seen. At that time, revival comes to Israel. And it says, and they will look upon me, whom they have pierced. And it says, and I will pour out on them on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, I will pour out the spirit of grace. What's the spirit of grace? That's the spirit of salvation, isn't it? God's kindness for salvation. I will pour on them the spirit of grace and supplication. Supplication is a kind of prayer. One of the seven types of prayer that I've discovered in the Bible. It means a bowing down. It means uh, a wrestling in your spirit when something tragic has happened. If your son has a car accident and you cry, you take hold of the horns of the altar and you start to cry. Your son's in intensive care. The doctor says, we don't know if he's going to make it through the night. And you're down on your face to the floor and you're crying out to God like Jesus wept in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's supplication. He's supplicating. All of his insides are, are turning and churning with prayer and anguish and calling upon God for a miracle. It's a cry for a miracle in a time of great disaster. And here it says that God's going to pour out upon them at this time of war a spirit of grace and of supplication. And they will look upon the Lord. Prophetically, they're going to look upon him, the one that they have pierced. And they're going to grieve because they're going to realize that all of these years, he's our firstborn son. He is our number one son. And we haven't seen it. And there will be war mourning and grieving and repentance. And the Holy Spirit will move on the whole land of Israel. It will become upon the house of David, the kingly tribes. It will come upon the house of Nathan, the prophetic tribes. It will come upon the house of Levi, the priestly tribes. It will come upon the house of Shimei, the warrior tribes. And it will come upon all the other families and all the other tribes and their wives. This is not just something political. This is not just uh, something that is, you know, at the, at the senior level of of uh, showmanship or something. This is in the homes. This is domestic. It says, and their wives are going to catch hold of this too. The whole nation. It, you, you should watch closely because one day on Fox News and, and uh, if CNN smartens up, maybe it'll be on CNN and there'll be people in the streets of Jerusalem with uh, the microphones and they'll be saying what's going on here people are dancing in the streets people are laughing people are crying they can't seem to make up their mind uh, there are some kids are lying on the ground they're shaking all over what's going on here can you tell me oh yes this is the best day in all of our history we've just come to see as a people we've come to realize our eyes have been opened we've got a revelation from God Jesus Yeshua 
is the Messiah. He is the one we've been looking for. We missed him all these years, but now we have this revelation. The Spirit of God has come upon us, and we see it, and the whole nation is coming to the Lord. Whoa! In the middle of war, it says the weeping will be great, like the weeping of Hadad Ramon in the plains of Megiddo. You know what happened there? The greatest, I say this tongue in cheek, but the greatest of all the kings of Israel, Josiah, became the king when he was only eight years of age. The first thing he did was to tear down all the high places, all the ashtras, all the idols that his forefathers had set up around the land. He reigned for 30 years, and he brought back all the temple worship and holiness unto the Lord. And God prospered the people, and great joy came upon the land of Israel under Josiah. There was no one like him from the age of 8 to 38. He was such a champion for the goodness and the purity of the Lord and the call of God. But the Egyptians were traveling up the coast and cutting across Megiddo to attack their enemy, which was in the direction of Babylon. And Pharaoh's name at that time was Nico. And Nico sent word, Nico the Pharaoh sent word to Josiah, let us pass through your land. Do not stop us. And Josiah said, no, this is our territory and our land, and you cannot bring your chariots and all your army and tromp our, our fields and our grain and, and travel through our nation. You cannot. And he took his soldiers out to Megiddo, out to the same place where Armageddon will be, to fight against the Egyptians. And that day, the Egyptians shot an arrow in the heart of King Josiah. And he died. And the whole nation went into mourning. For 40 days, they couldn't stop crying and weeping because of this king of theirs who they loved so much, had just been killed in battle. And that's what it's going to be like when the Lord opens the eyes of the Jewish people and they look upon him whom they have pierced and they'll grieve and mourn like one mourns over a firstborn son, like the weeping of Hadad Ramon in the plains of Megiddo. The national Mourning was set over the whole land for 40 days. And then all of these people will experience salvation one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. And then you know, in the original text, there's no chapter divisions. You know that, don't you? That it was later when Bible scholars canonized the Bible they, they looked for subjects and they, they put their, a new chapter here. And, but actually in the original text there was no division of chapters. It's just for study purposes. There were no verses, no chapters. So it says in verse 14, chapter 12, and all the rest of the clans and their wives will be saved. And then you go right to the next verse, chapter 13, verse 1 on that day. That's just about this day. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. This is not when Jesus came. They didn't have wars like this when Jesus came. They were under Roman rule they were subjugated 
to the tyranny of the Roman Empire. They weren't fighting back. All the promises that are in this scripture never happened yet in the history of Israel. But at the time when they become an immovable rock and all the nations are gathered around them and everyone who attacks them injures themselves at this time, remember, Israel's God's prophetic time clock. At this time, revival will come. And it says, a fountain will be opened. There's a great hymn about this fountain that we Christians like to sing. There is a fountain filled with blood. How many of you know this song? Good. There's some Christians here. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and all who plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. That's the song that came from this verse that talks about revival coming to Israel. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem What's the fountain? It's the fountain of the blood of Jesus to cleanse them from all sin and impurity. It's another of many scriptures that talk about the end time revivals that are coming to the Jewish people. So you have to be really careful who you listen to because you should listen to the Bible. You know, Jesus does have the last word. The Bible is the final story. It will tell you what will be in your newspapers tomorrow. And we love all people. We are not anti-Arabs. I have aunts who are Arabs. Two of my aunts are Arabs. I love them. We're not anti-Arab. But we're really pro-God. And his plan is his plan. If he said for some reason that the Canadians were his chosen people, you better believe it and don't mess with God. And if the United States tried to overtake Canada, if Canada was God's chosen people and Jesus was going to put his throne in Toronto... All of the weaponry of the United States would not be able to overturn that. And we could have the whole world up in arms. In fact, we would against Canada. It doesn't mean you hate the rest of the world. It just means that God's plans are God's plans and they come first. And God will give every people group an assignment. He'll give them their place and he'll give them their purpose for everyone who serves the Lord. Some, it will take a long time before they learn this. Most of us humans are slow learners. But if you want a blessed life, not a life without battles, you're not getting that. But if you want a blessed life at the end of the day, find out what God is doing and line up with him. It's time to love Israel and to love God's purpose with his chosen people. And to recognize that God loves all people. But he does have a chosen people for a chosen purpose in a chosen place. And he's going to guard it right to the end until all of it is accomplished. So Israel's military defense is tied up with the United States of America right now. I thank the Lord for a president who I don't think understands all this. He's just doing it with Israel. And maybe he understands some of it. But God's going to bless the United States of America because of this. And we will partner with Israel. And if you haven't been yet, you should get your ticket and come and join us and let your life expand into the purpose and call of God for this time. Will you stand to your feet? We're going to continue this theme. We have two more studies still to go. This was study number five. And we will be...
getting into the glory of God that will be coming to Israel and to the nations, to the church. We're going to get further on into the future because we've already passed in time where, the, where, the script, where we are right now. We're going off into the future now with what the Lord says about Israel in the days to come. I really encourage you not to miss the next two Wednesdays. Okay, would you pray this prayer with me? Hold your hands out. And would you pray? Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for all you are teaching me. Let me not be on the wrong side of the purposes of God. Let me love all people, but walk with you in your purpose. So, Lord, I dedicate myself to bless Israel, to be in step with your end time purposes for your chosen people. Bless the church here in America and around the world that there might be partnership with Israel and the church and the one new man will come forth. Let it happen. And let the blessings of God come upon this United States of America. We receive your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Put your hand on your heart. Let me bless you. And those of you who are watching online, I encourage you also to put your hand on your heart right now. And let me bless you. In the name of Jesus, I speak a blessing over you. Regardless of what nation you have come from, what ethnicity, what people group, what the color of your skin might be, I speak God's kindness to be upon you, his mercy, his favor, his goodness. I stand with you for the move of the Holy Spirit in your life, for new days, for your eyes to be open, to see Jesus as the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the King of the Jews, and for the Holy Spirit to become your indwelling teacher and comforter and your God. I speak blessings over you now, over your marriage, over your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. I speak the joy of the Lord into your heart and the peace of God in your home and the favor of God over your life. I speak it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you one last announcement, and this can go on the, on the recording as well. Um, on the 25th of October, Paul Wilbur will be with us, Michael Brown will be with us, Rick Joyner will be with us, and we will have a Roar from Zion conference right here in this place. The registration is free, but it's very expensive for us. So I'm gonna, we're going to take a couple of offerings, and I ask you to prepare yourselves for that so that when you come, um, we just wanted it to be open so that nobody would be hindered by a registration fee. But it's going to be an amazing time of impartation. And if it, oh, but you have to register because uh, once we have 1,500 or 2,000 people, we will be maxed out. And uh, we're pretty sure we will fill this place. All right? God bless you. And have a good night.